Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Shuchi, and I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith out of Boston, Massachusetts. The Transnational Literature Series considers themes of migration, identity, and our ideas of home. Usually our events are in store, but we are going to be virtual for the rest of the year. This is our last event for the summer, um, but we have a lot scheduled for the fall, beginning on September 10th with our Translating Spanish panel with Sophie Hughes, Megan McDowell, and Alejandro Oliva. If you wanna know more about what we have coming up, you can sign up for our newsletter or follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, just a few Zoom tips before we begin. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a few icons. Um, one of those is a Q&A icon where you can enter in your questions at any time during the conversation. Um, and another button will get you to the chat window. Unlike in-person events, you do have the ability to chat with one another and that space is there for you all. Um, and my colleague Pierce will be in there as well, dropping useful information, including links to our author's books. And um, we do make every effort to keep these events free to attend in the hopes that you will purchase the featured book from us. So thank you in advance for taking a look and supporting independent bookstores. And finally, you can see us, but we can't see you. So relax and please enjoy the conversation. Now to introduce today's guests. Morgan Jerkins is the author of the New York Times bestseller, This Will Be My Undoing, and the senior editor at Zora. A visiting professor at Columbia University, Jerkins' short form work has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Rolling Stone, Elle, Esquire, and The Guardian, among many others. She's here to talk about her most recent book, Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration Reclaims Her Roots. Joining Morgan in conversation about her book is novelist and editor Angie Cruz. Her novel, Dominicana, was the inaugural book pick for the GMA Book Club and was shortlisted for the Women's Prize. Cruz is the author of two other novels, Soledad and Let It Rain Coffee. She's published shorter works in the Paris Review, BQR, Callaloo, Gulf Coast, and other journals, and she's the founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning literary journal Asterix. An associate professor at University of Pittsburgh, she splits her time between Pittsburgh, New York, and Turin. Thank you both for being here tonight, and thank you all, and now Morgan and Angie. Thank you. So I guess I'll start by reading a little selection. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I'm gonna read a selection that's really near and dear to my heart, and it explains why my family, my mother's side of the family, um, fled the South. They were part of a larger group of African Americans who escaped from the South um, due to racial terrorism, also known as the Great Migration, um, from the year 1910 to 1970, millions of African Americans scattered across the United States in search of a different kind of beauty and freedom on American soil. And this is a story that my 70-something-year-old grandfather had not even told to anyone. So I'm going to start off with that. I guess I can tell the story now, my grandfather said in a measured tone. My maternal family's trajectory began with my great-grandfather, whose name was Fred Andrew Jerkins I. Five generations of men in my family bear his name. He was born in America's Georgia, and he married Gladys Wiggins of Andersonville, Georgia. The Wigginses were a well-to-do Black family who owned a plantation near Sumter County. The Jerkins family were sharecroppers at first, before they were able to afford to buy their own land. Gladys bore 16 children, but three did not survive into adulthood. From what my mother told me, she had a child every year. She passed in her 50s. There is about a 25 year age difference between her eldest and youngest child, who was only a year older than one of their grandchildren, my aunt Shireen. Life was idyllic until the accident happened. Fred was driving a car one night and hit a white man. No one in my family can confirm if that man survived. Fred jumped out of his vehicle and made a run for it through the woods where some of his relatives lived. Those relatives told him that he had to leave town or else he would be killed. News had spread fast. Fred I was no stranger to the threat of a noose. From, from 1877 to 1950, Georgia was second only to Mississippi in the number of lynchings. As a teenager, he would hear other Black people being lynched, their screams, their pleas for mercy, and he knew that there was nothing he could say to absolve him of hurting a white person, even if it was an accident. The white overseer of the cotton plantation was fond of my great-grandfather's productivity 
and hit Fred in the trunk to drive him as far as he could while a mob was screaming Fred's name and vowing to string him up. The overseer drove him until the path was blocked by a body of water. Fred crossed that water by himself, traveled some ways, and found refuge with a relative near the border of Georgia and Florida. No one knows how long he was gone, but the coast was clear after another black man's body was found floating in the water near Americans. White people thought Fred had died. Maybe some other whites got to him first, or maybe he just drowned. Either way, he was gone. Fred returned to America and tried to continue his life as though nothing had happened. He worked in the cotton fields as he had before the accident. However, as soon as word got out that Fred I was very much alive, a white mob showed up at the plantation where he worked. His employer, who my grandfather said was a mean man, invited the mob to kill him, but then said whoever took the first step would get shot with his Winchester rifle. No one harmed him. Fred I stayed in America, settled down with my great-grandmother, and had children. But in the back of his mind, he was always worried that someone would find him hanging from a tree branch. Fred saved his money, and the Jerkins family left Georgia while my grandfather was still a baby, taking the railroad to Philadelphia, where over 200,000 Black refugees, primarily from Virginia, South Carolina, Maryland, and Georgia, had already called the city of brotherly love their new home. Had my great-grandfather not fled from America, he might well have been murdered. My grandfather would have never been born, and therefore I would not be alive. The first time he fled was for self-preservation. The second time was for the preservation of his entire family. It was only through the creation of this book that my mother, who was in her 50s, found out that her father wasn't even born in New Jersey. I'll never forget how my mother looked when she realized this. Her face sank. Her jaw went slack. Ironically, at the moment when our family history was being recovered, she was at a loss for words. She hardly blinked as we sat, stunned within the silence between us. I wondered if she felt disappointed in herself as a parent or in her parents for not having passed these stories down in conversations over dinner or by a fireplace before they would be presented to a wider audience in a book. My grandfather had been to America only once when he was six or seven. His parents brought him to the cotton fields, but he could not recall anything else from his experiences there. Neither I, my sister, nor any of my cousins has ever been to Sumter County. We don't know what happened to the acres of land that my family was able to afford from their earnings as sharecroppers. All we know is that Fred Jerkins I was the last owner. I wanted to know more about the time when Black land was vast and how the migration of Blacks from the land that they tilled led to uphill battle. According to Leah Douglas of The Nation, in the 45 years following the Civil War, freed slaves and their descendants accumulated roughly 15 million acres of land across the United States, most of it in the South. What this land meant to free slaves was a chance for intergenerational wealth and economic mobility. But in the 20th century, about 600,000 Black farmers lost their land. Some of the reasons, systemic racism by the United States Department of Agriculture, the attraction of Black Southerners to work in Northern factories, and thus the Great Migration. My great-grandfather was one of those 600,000. My great-great-grandfather was that sharecropper who worked within the 45 years following the Civil War and he was able to buy land so that my great-grandfather would own it outright. No one knows if Fred Jerkins I gave up the land willingly or involuntarily. All my grandfather and his siblings can tell me is that in 1945 or, 40, or 1944 or 45, they boarded a train from Georgia to Philadelphia where relatives awaited them, and that was that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. We just jump into conversation. Yep. Yeah, let's jump into conversation. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, while you were reading, I had all these questions that surfaced in my bad handwriting, but I'm going to stick to my typed questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then I'll like try to figure out what I said. Um, and anyone who has questions, please, please, please enter them in the Q&A because I'll be looking at them and also feeding from them and asking Morgan. But before I do that, I want everyone to see the book. Like, this is the book. And, um, and you should get it. It's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Um, so, okay. So I've known Morgan <laughs> for a really long time now because, you know, Morgan Jerkins was my former student at Bennington College. Mm -hmm. And for the past two days, I've been rereading the letters we wrote to each other um, before you even wrote your last book. So it's like, I feel like I've been watching your voice change and your ideas develop. And it's just really exciting to be here. Um, uh, in numerous interviews and on Twitter, you 
Like, you know, I'm scared of Twitter. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to say the wrong thing and I'll be oh, canceled. Lauren is not scared of Twitter. I, yeah, no, I am. I definitely am. But it's just like, whatever. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. <laughs> yeah. What I love about the way that you tweet is that you actively um, push, right? So you, 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 in this really smart way, like you complicate some of the arguments that are showing up around colorism, interracial relationships, you know, oh. and you start asking questions. And I said, oh, no, no, no. Morgan's going to get in trouble. And because, you know, like you're, <laughs> you know, it's hard because it's like, and we could talk about this. There were many moments in the book where I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get dragged for writing this because all it takes, and I've seen it happen to myself, I've seen it happen to other writers, they take screenshots of certain things out of context and they mangle and maim it to make a straw man argument. And what happens is it, it can either be because they're not engaging in good faith um, and it could be to humiliate. But I told myself in order to get this work done, I had to push past that. And, you know, because we're in the lockdown, I like having these conversations and I don't try to be right. I just like posing questions. But I think it's really interesting when, when, when we talk about histories of the diaspora, Black American histories, there are certain things that arouse more intense reactions than others. And I've noticed that. So I have to say, right, so what I, so I started thinking about this because when I was reading your book, there's this moment where you're with Professor Jubilette, um, Julie Vett. Yeah. And, um, and you and you say, I'm humbled. Like you literally say, I was humbled because I suddenly started to see some notions that you had shift yep. right? based on the things you were learning. But this is a constant in the ways that you approach work, right? Like you're researching and you're researching, trying to understand. And in the book, you're even saying, I am humbled constantly, which I love, right? Because you're not going in and saying, I know exactly. You give space for people to tell their stories the way they want to do it. Why do you think that is? Like that you can do that? Because it takes a lot of courage, I think. Thank you. I, I think it's just because I have to remind myself that I've been Black American my whole life, but I live in New Jersey. I lived in New Jersey. That's specific. And I think for me, I had all of these assumptions and I lay it plain, whether it's regard to Creole communities, whether it's regards to Black people's relationship to water or root work or conjure. And every time someone was telling me that's not true, whether it were they were emphatically saying it like verbatim or they were just showing me through their stories. And for me, I was like, in order to do this work, I'm going to work on two levels. I'm going to show people what it's doing to me on an emotional level. Some of the complicated histories of Black people in this country that really made me uncomfortable. And I wanted readers to see that but I also wanted to let these stories breathe on their own because the people that I was talking to, they had the courage to open up their hearts and their lives to me. And they didn't know me from a can of paint, as my people would say, they didn't know me like that. And so it was like, I wanted to let them speak. And, and you know, whether or not, whether it rubbed me the wrong way is, is irrelevant. History doesn't have anything to do with your feelings. And mm -hmm. so I wanted people to hear from them as much as possible and to just be confronted with their biases just like I was. And what I realized through this trip was that it's one thing to say that Black people aren't a monolith. It's another to actually submerge yourself in these communities that you don't know anything about. And you really see how unifying yet distinct these sub-ethnic groups are. And so I constantly, in every single chat, in every single section, I had to constantly get out of my own way with some assumption that I had of some particular element of African-American life. Oh, I, but I mean, I appreciate that because I feel like in this moment where everyone wants the binary, I think there's like this push to be like this exact kind of claiming of an identity politic. And you're like, nope, nope, we're going to complicate it. I'm going to make it real messy. Right. I, yeah. Right. Because it's like, I'll speak about the Louisiana section, for example. Like, I have distant cousins of mine who do not identify as African American. They identify as Creole and they are very staunch about it. And the reason why they're staunch about it is because prior to Louisiana even becoming a part of the United States because of the Louisiana Purchase, Creole was a distinct group. They did not operate in that either or racial binary like we do. And what has happened because of becoming Americanized and becoming a part of this racial binary that was intensified because of Jim Crow and all that there's been these hard and fast lines. And so what I wanted to explore was what are the repercussions of that? What gets lost within the subtext 
of these identities. And so I definitely had to just blur it a bit and talk about the history that precedes even the formation of this country. Well, you know, I, so, okay, I have background information on you, right? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. I'm gonna turn red, but that's okay. So, no, but it's great. It's like when I, so when I was working with you, I was just like, again, I had presumed, right, certain things about you, and I was like, because, you know, I was like, oh, she's like me. Maybe she didn't have access to certain things, or she made these choices, right, because you come from working class, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're like, oh, I speak Japanese, I speak Russian. And then I started reading about your passion for these languages and why you learned them. And I recently read an essay about why you learned to speak Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. You wanted to get into a culture, like it had an intimacy with the literature in Russian. You wanted to get into the culture, Puerto Ricans and, you know, Dominicans and like, and like move in the world in a certain way mm -hmm. when you were inside, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, wow, like you literally have been training because I find like learning a new language is the one place where if you're not okay with failing, you'll never learn it. Right. And I got my butt handed to me. I mean, I've always been a, I've always been a nosy person, whether it was going to the nail salon and hearing people speak Spanish or Vietnamese, uh, whether it was going to Japan as a teenager and realizing that the natives there, the locals there were trying to cater to us and speaking to us. I'm like, how are you speaking English? Like, we're in your country. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to learn different languages. And I think that maybe my, the way that I can humble myself started from language learning, starting from that place of understanding how my personality can change depending on which language I'm speaking, understanding the customs and just establishing a bond, you know, and getting out of your own way in that way. But this is, this is this book. This is what you do in this book, right? Like when you talk about wandering in strange lands, like, yes, you're going into your family story. You're going into the story of America. You're trying to complicate it. But like, really, it's like, we all have this assumption of what it means to be Black in America. We have this assumption. We have, and, and Black people do it. Right. And I, and I, I have- a, each other. That's what I'm saying. The limitations. Right. We right. do it to each other. And I think that's the hard part is like, what are the- consequences of that if someone doesn't look black if someone doesn't uphold this tradition does that make them any less black or does that complicate what we think of a black american identities mm -hmm. and i think that that's what i wanted to show people is that we, we have unifying forces with regards to systemic violence and land displacement but they're they're just they're still distinct mm -hmm. um and they're and that, and that deserves to be illuminated yeah, no, I, I, um, I could see like all that training you've done with language um, play out in the way that you, the generosity, right? The generosity in your nonfiction. It's really, um, I, I think, inspiring. And I, you know, I hope people like young writers can learn from that, right? That it's not about, I know this subject, I'm going to write about it. I'm the expert. You're kind of like, I'm coming in and I'm trying to learn with the community. I'm yeah. trying to grow with the community. But also, like, I thought to myself, I was worried. And I'll be honest with the people in this room, like, the success that I had with my first book scared the crap out of me. Because I didn't expect for the, for the anticipation to be that high. And I didn't expect to hit the list. I didn't expect any of that. Because I always had this idea of if it doesn't work out. So when I exceeded expectation that way, I was like, oh my God, how am I going to follow up on that? What if I'm just a one hit wonder and I have a sophomore slump? And adding on to the fact that my book deal was bigger than my last one, I was like, I was worried. And I was worried that I was getting too ahead of myself because if you, know, if you read the book, you'll see that there's a lot of cultural anthropology in there. There's a lot of his history and I'm not trained in that way. Um, I, 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 my, my background is writing in literature and comparative literature. So I was worried and I felt like I had to humble myself because I wasn't dealing with methodologies and quantitative and qualitative, qualitative methods. I was just presenting stories and trying to contextualize them as best as I can while giving them also the intimate feel. So I was worried throughout the whole time from first draft to, you know, copy edits completed that I was way in over my head and I should leave it to the real uh, professionals. No, are you kidding? No, you did great. And I think that the, what, what you're saying is making me think about how um, audience, right? Because your first book, I'm assuming, so when I was mentoring you, you had said that you write for your future daughter or you write for your teenage self. Like there were two 
you know, like you were kind of like, this, this is what I think this is what I'm writing for, right? Which are two different people, obviously, but mm -hmm. as you're working, that happens. Mm -hmm. um, so your book comes out and your audience and your audience changes because the feedback also makes you realize who your audience right, is. Right. One, I want to know, who, did you figure out like who your audience is after your last book? And who are you writing to for this book? Well, for me, it was just like, see, it's hard. Cause you know, when you're trying to sell a book and when you're with a mainstream publisher, you're like everybody, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, you know what I'm saying? I think when I wrote, this will be my new, I was speaking to my inner child for sure. Now that I have some distance from it, I was speaking from that wounded inner child that just needed someone to validate her emotions and her, and their, her experiences. I think with Water in a Strange Land, because I involve so many people in it, it makes me think about like I'm speak. It makes me think about my future, the children that I want to have, the children that now can trace their family back 300 years, so that they always can be able to tie themselves to a name and to a place right here on American soil. I think about the black people who have always heard stories, but they may have been afraid of where it may lead them. They may discredit them because they couldn't find documented truth about these stories. Mm -hmm. What I hope that those people will, you know, start to research again and, and, and double back and revisit. Um, but I also think about the white people. You know, this book is coming out of the time, you know, after the George Floyd protest happened, which was, none of us could have foreseen that. But it's like we're having these in, in, enormously important yet cyclical conversations about black rage in this country, about violence against black people. And I think that this book can serve as one testament that the devastation that keeps happening to us is not just because of slavery, it is rippling to the present day. And if we don't really assess the magnitude of that loss, it will just keep happening. Mm -hmm. so, so I think about it for different people because I think that it's gonna have more of an emotional feel perhaps for that black curious woman who was trying to figure out more about her family. And it might have a different feel for perhaps a white historian that may be doing a thesis on perhaps Gullah Geechee communities. It might have a different reaction to it. Right, right, right. You know, someone just asked a question and I think it's directed to what you just said. So I'm okay. just gonna leap into it. Um, the question is, I would love to hear one of the assumptions that people take for granted when you were speaking of, and, and what, what story allowed you to question it? Oh, well, I'm not gonna say people take for granted, but I'll just say, you know, I grew up in a public school system and I was taught a very streamlined yet narrow idea about black people in this country, which is that my people were captured on or near the west coast of the African continent. They were brought over via the Atlantic Ocean to the colonies. Slavery happened, then emancipation, then reconstruction, then Hall of Renaissance, civil rights movement, and then Obama. That's, that's how streamlined it was. I thought that before Lincoln, white equals master black equals slave and that wasn't the case and i realized that when i went to louisiana i realized that free people of color or free black people existed prior to lincoln i also found out that there were thousands of black slave owners not just in louisiana but across the country they participated in the plantation economy and granted some of them bought their family members with the intent of manumitting or freeing them but they still participated in it. So when I look at this information and I realize when it comes to white and black, pre-Lincoln, they weren't always diametrically opposed with regards to access to financial, social capital, then that complicated my idea of being black because I actually had family members of mine, ancestors of mine who were free, free people of color and also slave owners themselves. Um, and that was very hard to grapple with. But I had to, I, I had to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of connected. So I had read that one of your favorite books was Lolita. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're like, where am I going with this? Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> so, you know, it was one of my books, like it had a profound impact on me too. And I didn't even realize the impact until 20 years later, I published the Dominicana. And I realized, oh my God, I'm writing about a 15 year old that's like being married to a man twice his age, you know? And, and, and one of the reasons you were interested in it was because you said it gave you insight to what men could get away with in broad daylight. Yep. 
And that resonated because I'm like, oh my God, yes, that's why, you know, I wrote my book too. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned George Floyd and, and you know, and like the black rage from these things where these things are happening in broad daylight, right? right? Just in broad daylight. And yet they're getting away with it. Right. Just getting away with it. Right. And that's the thing I want people to understand is like, anytime black people in this American landscape have tried to exert their autonomy, particularly with movement, because movement characterizes so much African-American life, whether forced or involuntary migration, there has been things put in place by white people to curtail that movement, whether it's sundown towns, whether it's redlining and spatial segregation, whether it's state surveillance and police violence, everything has been, there's been things put in place coast to coast, region to region to curtail our movement. And I think that that was, you know, really important to me is that whether it's, like I said, whether it's a sundown town or the foot on the neck or a knee on the neck, it's been a way to stomp out our movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's so important to just to talk about that, that legacy of just being aware of what things white people get away with in broad daylight. And even to this day, like, I'm emotionally processing the things that I heard, the pictures and the videos that I captured because I was afraid. I was afraid that when I came back to New York and I told my publishers this, they would not believe me. Like they would not believe what I was able to capture. And oftentimes I gaslit myself. I was like, wait a minute, was that figure right? Did she really say that? Because I was like, there's no way that this has happened for so long as, as it has, but it, but it has. So, it really has. But yeah, so like, so I was thinking, right? Like, yeah, these books like Lolita written so long ago, right? And these things that happen in broad daylight and injustice. And then I think, yeah, your book came out exactly at the right time politically, I think. Um, you can't even plan it, but it did, right? Like, no, no. I will tell you, I will tell you a funny story. Um, so I started to get into tarot for a little bit. And there's this one tarot reader who I love, I guess because of her voice and she just seems really warm. She's across the pond, she's in the UK. And I was asking about my book. The lockdown just happened. My book was slated to come out mid-May. And I was like, what's happening to my book? And she started you know, pulling the card and she was like, I sense there's gonna be a delay, but it's gonna come out at the right time. Literally four hours after that reading, I get an email from my editor and it was like, so we're thinking of like pushing it back to August. Like, how do you think? And I was like, do it. Because I was already emotionally swamped because I live, I live alone in Harlem. And, you know, I tell people the end of March to all of April was so macabre for me. I didn't hear anything. I live near Central Park. I didn't hear a dog barking. I didn't hear police, excuse me, people conversing. All I heard every night was just a blaring silence. Excuse me, the, bar the blaring sirens. Um, and it was just, it was deathly. And so I was glad to have more time to really get myself together to promote a book. But then the protest happened. It was like, oh, wow. And it, and it took on a another meeting for me then. Because literally two years prior to when the protest happened, I was doing field work in California with an underground rapper. And he took me at the intersection of Florence and Normandy which was the start of the Rodney King riots in 92. And I asked him, I said, do you think this is gonna happen again? And he told me, and I'm paraphrasing, he was like, if, the, if, if the, this country does not reckon with what it has done to black people, it will happen again. And what happens? Two years later, the George Floyd protest happened. So it was very eerie. Yeah, no, but I, so thinking about books and how they impact us, right? Like the profundity of it. And then thinking about books that come out in the right time, like I wonder, like, do you think, because it's, this shit still keeps happening, regardless right. of how books are out there. So do you still feel like the work of a writer is like as important as being on the streets or, you know what I mean? Like towards social justice, like in your mind, like as you use your energy, where do you think the work is for us as artists and writers? To speak the truth. You know what I'm saying? Like speak up for the people who can't. You know what I'm saying? Because I think about myself, the reason why I also humbled myself when I went to these communities is I realized that even though I'm black like them, I can still be seen as part of the establishment. I live in New York. I have a mainstream public publisher. I've written for mainstream publications. That's the type of power and access that some of these people that I was talking to just did not have. And mm -hmm. so for me, it's like, 
I don't call myself an activist because I'm not on the ground. Of, I'm not organizing things. But this is the work that invigorates me. I love telling Black people stories. I love figuring out the mysteries of Black American lives. That stuff just fascinates the hell out of me. Uh, you know, excuse my language. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, what I hope is that it's not a trend. I don't want it to be every time a black person dies ruthlessly on camera, you know, and they and the video was looped around the world that now all of a sudden we care about reparations that now all of a sudden we care about the legacy of slavery that now all of a sudden we care about black authors. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I want, I would want this book to be a lighthouse for people where they always can come back to it and they know, and they see it out from afar mm -hmm. to know that it's still happening even if it is not the the, the of the zeitgeist it's not on the top 20 stories covered in your favorite newspaper it is happening right now and a lot of the people that don't mean black people well the people in power they are banking on you turning your attention someplace else and not caring anymore so they can continue to replicate these injustices so we have to keep reminding ourselves that like the fight is still on and it's been on. That's right. You know what I mean? <laughs> that is so right. You know, wait, you, you must have heard Kamala Harris got picked as VP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just now, I was like, hurry up and pick the VP already. I was like, what's going on? But you know, um, as soon as I see it, right? Like I see all this stuff coming up. I'm like, wait, what's her race? What's her religion? And she has a complicated identity politic. And I said, again, this is where this book falls in the right time, right? Right. And somebody, yeah, yeah um, Abby Phillip, um, she's a, a politics supporter. She said, remember, she is the first black woman. She could be the first black woman to be VP and also the first South Asian woman. And that's something that has not been afforded to black people in this country. It is always an either or. If you are black, then you are black, even if you have a white mother. If you are black, you are black, even if you have a Pakistani father. Mm -hmm. There is no both and. And that's because of the ghost of the one drop pool. That's also because of Jim Crow. It's because of all these different things. And when we don't allow for these spaces to hold both truths, what does that do to our consciousness? What does that do to our, even our ideas about black people, period? It puts us into these really strict parameters and the people who do possess these different identities, they suffer for it. So that's something I, that I'm just like, keep in mind, yes, she's a black woman, but she's also a South Asian woman too. Mm -hmm. And that part can't be ignored either. Right, no, I, I, you know, reading about it and then seeing the reaction to Kamala Harris and everyone trying to f pin her down, like, what is she? Yeah. That this book is going to be a great conversation starter because, and you know, have you already? I mean, I know it's, it hasn't been out that long, but have you already received feedback? Because, like, for my book, for example, like one of the biggest feedback is that people have gone and looked at their asked their mother's history, oh. so that all this questioning. So, I'm curious, this book feels like it would have the same kind of you know reaction. Yeah, I mean, I've had people that says this is inspiring me to look at my family and, um. The day after Pub, which was last Wednesday, um, uh, the New York Times published an excerpt from the book on um, Hilton Head and the amount of black land loss that has happened with a group down there called the Gullah Geechee Group, a sub-ethnic group, African Americans. And I was just talking to the man that I pretty much profiled in that section, and he was saying how it is the talk of the town down there and how everyone along the Gullah Geechee Corridor, which goes all the way from... Um, from you know, Georgia, South Carolina, Georgia to Florida have been talking about it. They're happy because they have not even had local news reporters cover what is going on down there. And that is my work. That's the thing that excites me, that I can have the power and the access to talk about the devastation of these communities and to literally, I hate to say it, like light fire under some asses. Yeah, I know. Because, I'm, because it's, at, the, at a certain point, just like enough is enough. You know what I mean? And granted, it's surprising, knock on wood, that I have not seen, no one has emailed me yet, but I know what I've seen. I've got pictures to prove it. I have people down there to prove it. And that is my work that I do. So if I have to keep holding people, you know, ruffling some feathers down there and expose that veil on a larger platform, because they're happy that it was the New York Times, the paper of record, right? Can't get any better than that. So be it. That's my work. Yeah, I know. I I, while reading that section of the book, I was so, I, what I love about the way you wrote it is that it wasn't like you were imposing your ideas. It's almost like you just evoked the space and the kind of 
you know, it's just so sad to think that people's land was just taken from them in a time where they didn't have like the paperwork, right? Yeah. You know, like, and, and so it make it just makes you feel, I was full of rage basically. Cause I know this happens, but you depict it in a way that you're just like, now people are like on a resort and they're, you know, like not knowing. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and I actually spoke to a Hilton head reporter today um, who works at the Island Packet, which is the low country South Carolina major newspaper there. And she was talking to me and she was like, well, because of heirs property, for any of you who don't know, um, the descendants of the enslaved, uh, what happened was freed slaves, when they got land, they passed it down to their descendants, but they often didn't have wills involved. So here's the problem with that. Let's say if I have a grandfather who has nine acres to give, excuse me, a father that has nine acres to give to me and my two other siblings. So that's three acres apiece. We all need to band together because if one of the siblings decides I want to sell my three acres to a property developer, the property developer encroaches on that land, it gives them that much, much more leverage to buy the other six acres. The other injustice that's happening is I was just told this by the reporter is that if people can't pay their taxes for a year, that property goes up to auction. And she said to me, what's the injustice in that? I said, well, think about it. More black people are impoverished than white people on the island. And that's not specific. That's all over the country. And because of that wealth gap, if you keep increasing the taxes, the man that I profiled, Ty Scott, said one, one family, $17,000 in taxes. So if you keep raising the taxes and you're not raising their salary to meet those taxes, then how could, then of course it's going to go for auction. Are you setting the black people there up to fail? And that is what I wanted to tell her is that, you know, you, we got to look at the, the elements there, right? It's not just a matter if they can't pay their taxes because then you start to pathologize poverty with regards to black people. What are the situations in place that is, that is making, you think people just don't want to pay their taxes, especially on land that was passed down to them from their ancestors? No. Right. No, it's incredible. Um, so, I'm like, so, so I saw that you call yourself a cinephile, which I love, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I know you're working on a novel. What's the name of the novel? Cause it's coming out soon too. What's the name? Carl Baby. Carl Baby. Is it the novel that you were working on in, in grad school? With Alex T, not the one that me and you worked oh, on with it, okay. but I'm Alex T. Yeah. And I was trying to write, um, a, a short story. I wanted to try my hand at short stories. And then Alex Chi, if any of you know, fantastic author and literary citizen. And he was like, no, this needs to be a novel. And I'm glad I took his advice. But what I was going to say is that what you do in this book, is like, it has all the scenes, right? So I, I feel like you use your novel skills, <laughs> your storytelling skills and you, into your creative writing and set up these scenes. So oh, thanks. All those things, right? Like, yeah. oh, you're saying it's like you bring us in there and you have us see the whole space and then you know and then you're like boom yeah and i wanted people and I, and I wanted to make sure it didn't feel cold no it um, all, and i wanted to make sure that you know in the beginning i, I thought i was going to write this book as a distant observer and i got today my zora pin my friend gave me a zora pin because she was she reminded me that you can be subjective and still tell stories in a journalistic an authoritative way. And I think for me, like just regards to like setting the scenes, like I wanted this book to have a pulse so much. I wanted people to, when they read about the low country, they can feel that muggy heat. They can see the gnats. When they go to Louisiana, they can smell the jambalaya. When they go to Oklahoma, they can visualize the acres and acres of, you know, acreage you know, or you know green or when they go to california they can think about the different territories the different highways that divide neighborhoods i wanted people to get a sense of that so when i brought people in that i introduced them i think maybe you're right like it definitely has a creative writer feel to it because i wanted people to just understand how full of life these people are mm -hmm. and they exist right now and they're fighting right now so i definitely wanted this book to have a heartbeat so to speak Oh my God, it totally does. I mean, just from the beginning, I just opened it up and I'm like, okay, you didn't read the beginning. So I could, I could read a little bit and it's really okay. good to hear your work read to you. Mm -hmm. And while I do that, and while you're all listening people, you can leave some questions for Morgan if you want to ask them. Mm -hmm. So um, this is from the prologue, The Milkman's Baby. Um, it goes, I was seven years old when I learned that I wasn't my father's only daughter. He pulled me to his side and said he had something to show me. I assumed that it was a gift, 
He would regularly visit me at my mother's home, bringing niceties along with his charisma and swagger. Instead, he pulled out his wallet and showed me photos of three girls before saying, these are your sisters. I mean, like, are you hooked in? I'm like hooked in. And, and, and you know, it was so hard to nail that first chapter. I was like, what can I say to start this? I had visited so many people. I've traveled so long. And I just want people to read it. And then I realized, well, you don't have to completely abandon your personal essayist background. Start with the, the intimate and then work your, and then keep expanding as you keep going on. So yeah, it definitely, when you read it, it definitely sounds like a mic drop. Like if I went to a Barnes and Noble or indie bookstore and I saw those first couple lines, I'm like, what? And then I just like turn my back. <laughs> That's good. You got to hook up in, right? And then they're in your world and then they're invested. Um, you know, when I first saw this, the, the title, I had seen it printed somewhere before the book came out, you know, and it was like, I said, oh, she wrote a book on traveling solo. And I, you know, like I was thinking about how, you know, I loved watching your, your, I don't know if you posted on Instagram or where, where you would say that you were traveling by yourself for the first time and that it became a big game changer. And I'm wondering, how did that impact also the ways that you, you work? What oh, cause from that experience, you know, it's actually from a woman at Bennington who said to me, like, I think you should do a solo trip because one day, if you want to get married, if you want to have children, your, your time is not going to be your own. And I'm really glad that I took her advice because the first solo trip I went on, um, was in the Bahamas right after I graduated from Bennington, right after I got my first book deal. And then my most recent solo trip I took, um, which it seems so painful talking about traveling during lockdown, but most recent solo trip I took was in Egypt, um, which was last November. And I'm so glad I have those memories for me, no one else but me. And these were places that I was afraid to go to by myself. I thought I was going to be bored. I thought I was going to get hurt. And they were life-changing experiences. I will say, though, that being a New Yorker, maybe I shouldn't say that to a native New Yorker, but being someone that lives in New York for five years, I just thought, oh, I can go down to the South. Ain't nobody going to touch me. They ain't touch me up North. I I'll do what I want. I you know, no. Like, I realized that there were many times throughout the South and when I went to Oklahoma where I should, I could have gotten hurt, definitely. Driving through sundown towns, being in a sundown town, for lunch, you know, that I didn't realize until after I came back and it was a sundown town. Um, being, just driving over the highways and the byways at night. And after I'm hearing stories of families disappearing, families dying because of their land allotments, you know what I mean? It was heavy energy. I mean, in, in fact, and this is something I detail in the book, there was one time when I was in Oklahoma where I was being followed. Me and another woman, a black indigenous woman, who was all of four, eight, I'm five feet. We were, she was trying to take me to show me some certain sites. And she had two men with her, black Seminole men, who were driving behind us. And I wondered why, I'm like, why? You know, we just finished a protest. One of them lived all the way in Wichita, Kansas, which is three hours from where we were. And she was like, you know, to make sure we're safe. And when we were out there, we were, we were being followed. And I think I'm always going to think about that moment. There are, my, there are times where I wonder, if, like, should I carry a gun? Should I have took a self-defense class? Because literally all I had on me was my, my purse, my phone, my recorder, and a prayer. That's it. And I was going through these open and carry states. I was going through these red conservative states. Who knows what could have happened? What kept you doing it, though? Like, how do you keep finding, like, what do you have? I have two questions. I feel like um, I know a number of um, women writers that are journalists that have found themselves in these really precarious situations. Mm -hmm. and what do you do to get, to make, yeah, like to survive or, and even thrive in your life after these kinds of heavy experiences and also what motivates and drives you to keep doing them? Well, I thought to myself, these people risk their lives to tell me certain situations. So how can I not give them honor by writing about it? On the surface level, I can say, well, I had a deadline to reach. So I had to do something. But I will say, you know, I'm a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. And there were places in the South that I went to where this, where this the magic and the spirituality was so palpable. It, you just felt like you can cut it with a butcher knife. It was so thick. 
And there were many times where I just felt protected by God, the ancestors, water spirits, if any of you believe in that. It, it just made me feel like someone was watching over me. I felt it when I was driving at night. I felt it when I was, you know, driving home from an interview. I just felt like I was being protected in that way. But there were many moments, and I, I elaborate in the book, where I'm by myself. I'm in my hotel room trying to mostly process, and I don't have a shoulder to lean on. I don't have somebody next to me to have a drink or, you know, watch a movie in the hotel room. I had friends that I would check in on, let them know I was staying, or family members, but I didn't have them there all the time. And so it definitely was a thing where I tried to connect by calling people. Uh, I definitely, you know, cried to some people when the drafts weren't coming together when I came back to New York. Um, but it, but it's still a thing to this day where I'm like, damn girl, you, 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 you did it. Like you're the ish. But then there's another part of me that's like, how did you do that? Like, I wonder if like, when I get older and I have a child of my own, I'm going to be like, mm, that was weird because I even had, and when I was over home with the woman, the woman that was with me that, you know, was with me when we were being followed, she even started off when we were driving to one of the protests. She was said, man, if you were my daughter, and it's your voice just tapered off. And I said, what do you mean? And I'm 26 years old. You know, I'm not a teenager. I was 26 years old at the time. And she was like, if you were my daughter, I'd be scared. And then that was it. So in thinking about, um, let's close with this, because I, I think, you know, we're almost up with time. It's like thinking about, unless someone has a pressing question. Oh, there is a question. Wait, let's ask this question. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about being in the right mindset to promote your book after having those experiences and still being in the moment. How did you ground yourself in what you just learned and while honoring the emotions you felt? Thank you. That's a great question. Therapy, therapy every week being in there and being able to validate my experiences and just know that like everything I felt was real, everything that I saw was real and to not second guess myself, um, creating self care routines, especially in the lockdown, you know, before I would get my nails done every other Friday, I would get a massage when I could. Um, I would go to the Met on Friday nights and I had to really, implement a self-care routine whether it was listening to certain songs whether it was dancing to move my body around whether it was facetiming friends um i had to ground myself that way and i think it's hard because it's weird when it comes to self-promotion with a book it's like writers get devalued all the time for our time and our money and i think that for me personally that definitely influences the work that i do on twitter and all this Place like buy my book, buy my book. But I'm also just like, this was a labor of love. Yeah, yes, I want you to buy it because you know it's a product, but it's like I'm thinking about the people who helped me with this. It when people say it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to create a book. And that's why every time I buy a book, I always look at the uh, acknowledgement sections first because I want to see the people who were there for that writer during the embryonic stages to make the book what it was. So that's why I encourage people when they look at my book, just turn to the back of the book. Every fit person I talked to, whether they were in the actual book itself or interviewed them, their names are there. They wanted their real names there. And that helped to ground me to remind myself, yes, you're nervous about it, but if you can't do it for you, do it for them. Yeah. And I think that's what helped me to just get myself together. So in those moments of isolation, while you traveled and now, like, what is, I, I, I want to have fun question. And the fun uh -huh. question is, what is an album or song that you listen to that keeps you company and sort of brings you back? You know, like, what is it? <laughs> oh, man, I would say, oh, it's really, it's weird song. So uh, <laughs> it's like, for example, every time I hear Post Malone Psycho, even though it sounds like a really great song, it's a really chill out song. The reason why I keep thinking about it is because that was the song I heard when I was driving back from Hilton Head um, back into Savannah. And it was already um, evening time. And I want to tell people, like, the way that I conducted myself on this trip was like a teenager. I tried to make sure that I was back in the hotel room, not just the hotel, the hotel room before sundown. And I was so nervous. I was like, oh my God, the sun is down. I had a really good interview and I was like, I I'm scared to drive because I was hearing all these different stories. And I remember when I turned on the radio and I heard that song, for some reason, I was able to steady my hands on a steering wheel and drive back on that highway to get to my hotel in Savannah. 
um, when I listen to um, Aerosmith, for example, it reminds me of driving from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. It was an hour and a half drive, and I just felt like my car was flying because I just felt really free at that moment. Ironically, as I'm driving through these sundown towns, I felt really free. Um, I also, another, I, I think another song, I think about, I don't know if any of you listen to Luke James, he's an R&B singer. That's another person who I listened to on, while I was there. Um, so those bring back memories for me. You know, I don't even know this Post Malone Psycho song. Yeah. And now I'm so curious, can I play a little bit of it? Oh my God, it's kind of embarrassing. Embarrassing? Yeah, but, okay. it's, a, but, it's, a, but it's a chill song though. It's not like a ragey song. So if you, when you listen to it, you'll probably be like, oh, I can see myself cruising at night to this song. All right, well, we'll save it. We'll save it. So I think that, um, any more questions? Is there um, anything else that wants to be said? Yeah, any other questions? I'm willing to talk about the writers like, oh, What's my oh, favorite? Oh wait, someone's asking, what's, what's like, your favorite Rick James song? Oh my God, I don't know. Uh, God, Super Freak, I suppose. That would probably be my favorite one. <laughs> yeah, I see it. Um, any other questions about like books, um, the writing life, this particular book? Um, I, I have a question. Um, well, one of it is, I don't know, like, I know you write about really heavy shit, but like, I also see you as someone that's also like full of joy. Like there's kind of like, it lives in tandem. Yeah. And what is the most joyous and fun part for you in the entire life of writing? Oh man. Um, when you hit it, like you might be during a writing session where you might write a thousand words, but it could be that one line or that one paragraph where you're just like, mm, like that was good, that was it. And I live for those moments because they don't happen every single, every single time I sit down, but when they do, it's like pure ecstasy. I think about the joy of watching people support my book. The type of reception that I've received so far in my book in a freaking pandemic, in a lockdown, where editors, publishers, and booksellers alike are trying to recalibrate how to support their authors. Um, it's just been phenomenal. That's the joy. And also, like, I have no reason but to be happy. You know what I'm saying? It's hard, but I'm a happy and joyous person because I wake up every morning and have the support to do what I love to do. I have the support to write the books I want to write. And, and document these stories. So writing is, it could be hella hard, but it is a joy for me to be able to have the ability to try and to endeavor. And that's what this book is, is an endeavor. Someone's asking, how do you see this book in conversation with your previous book? Well, people have told me to think of it as a huge departure um, because my first book is so intimate. It's so personal. And even though I include secondary sources, it was, it's like nowhere like this one. So when I think of this book in conversation with my first book, I see it as you're seeing a black female author come into her own and continue to mature. Mm -hmm. That's what I say because, you know, people are like, oh my gosh, like I wouldn't have expected this book to come out of it. It's because I want to try different, mm -hmm. different ways of a body of work. And so when I think about this book being conversation, it was how has this woman and this author grown? How has she flexed her skill? How has she pushed herself and the people in her life pushed her? So that's why I see how I see the conversation. Well, definitely, like, I, um, again, looking at our old letters that we wrote to each other, I remember I looked at your first draft that you sent me of something, and then you revised it, and it was like a whole other animal. And in the letter, I said, okay, I f you can write. You, you, you can take criticism. You can take edits. Okay, let's go. Let's go just move forward and that's what's crazy because when and i'm gonna tell you something like when i think about this book and i know people have those sob story but like i really cried some nights when it wasn't coming together when i couldn't find the census records when i couldn't find the birth certificates the death records 
I was crying because I thought to myself, this publisher has put so much money into me and my work. And I feel like I, I, I got way over my head. But then like my editors would say the same things. My beta readers, they were like, oh, you know how to revise really well. You know how to take criticism very well. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm doing a good job because I keep, I'm so hard on myself. And I also know the stakes of black writers in the industry that some of them don't get second chances. So I was so nervous about that. Well, congratulations, Morgan. This book is fantastic. Um, I can't wait to see your novel. Um, and thank you everybody for being here. And I think the bookstore is gonna come in and give their last words. Yeah, yeah. I just say thank you, everyone. It got a little bit dark in my space. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. This was an amazing conversation and so generous and so smart. Um, really, it, it's just, it was wonderful. Thank you both thank so you. much. Thank you all out there for being there um, and for asking such great questions. Um, have a great night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.